So we started talking about search algorithms. We defined a few terms. For example, the branching factor, the effective branching factor. We defined the very important term uh, completeness. A search algorithm is called complete if it finds a solution for every solvable problem. So this more or less means uh, the search algorithm, a complete search algorithm, will never oversee a solution if there is one. Uh, so this is of course a very important property for a search algorithm. Um, yeah, and then we have seen and hopefully also understood this theorem which says that uh, um, if I have a search tree with a large branching factor, um, then almost all nodes are on the last level. So you can actually uh, neglect all the nodes which are not on the last level. Um, okay. Then uh, we defined optimal. The search algorithm is optimal if it always finds the solution with lowest cost. Yeah? Um, so, and this is very important here. This does not talk about the computing resources the search algorithm consumes. It talks about the resources you consume later if you then have to travel the route uh, that the algorithm found. Yeah? So, yeah, let's talk about uh, your car navigation system. This car navigation system is optimal if the route it suggests to you is optimal. It, does not, it, it has nothing to do with the, the time it takes for this system to, to find the route. This is uh, different. Of course, we will also talk about uh, the computing time of our search algorithms. Okay, now let's start with the first uh, and simplest algorithm, which is breadth first search. So here in, in, uh, in this picture and the following, um, I numbered the nodes in the tree starting at the root and then level by level they are numbered. Yeah? And now what uh, breadth first search does, I mean, you read it here, breadth first. So that means we start with the root node and then expand the first level. Huh? Depth one, we expand all nodes. When the last node is expanded, we start expanding the first node in this uh, first level and then we get the second level, the full second level. Um, when we are finished with the second level, we start expanding all the nodes in the third level. And this is just a snapshot at a point where we have expanded this node number 10, but not yet expanded 11 and 12. And you see, um, these, uh, you see a set of nodes uh, which are gray, the other are white, and this is the set of open nodes. These are the currently open nodes that still have to be expanded. Huh? And they are expanded in the order of the numbers you see here. And that means the node that will be expanded next is number 11. It's not number 13 because 11 is smaller than 13. Of course, you have to expand 11, then 12, and then we have the full, uh, the, the, uh, then depth uh, 3 is full, and then we will start expanding this. That's spread first search. Let's look at the source code. So this is a pseudocode, but actually, I mean, if you, ha if you use a high-level programming language, like Mathematica or MATLAB or Python, uh, then your program is not longer than what you have here. Huh? If you do it in C, it's a little bit longer. Maybe it's three times as long. 
Um, okay, so press first search. As input, it gets a node list and a goal. I mean, if you start it at the root of the search tree, then this node list contains exactly one node, the starting node. Huh? Um, then uh, the, the important data structure is this list, uh, new nodes. Huh? It is empty at the beginning, and then for all nodes in node list, um, yeah, we go into this loop. If we have reached a goal, um, so that means if this current node is a goal node, uh, then we are finished, and then we return solution found and the node. Uh, um, else, yeah, what, what else? Let's look at the picture. So if this first node is not a goal node, then we will expand it. So, so then we will produce all successor nodes. Um, that's what happens here. This function successors uh, produces all the successors of the node, and these successor, uh, the successor list will be appended to our list new nodes. And then we have the updated new nodes list. And then now we have to check whether new nodes is empty. Uh, so, yeah, what, that, what does that mean, new nodes is empty? The current node was a leaf node. The current node was a leaf node first, yes. And what else? Yes, of course, if the current node was a leaf node, then there is no successor node. But also, I mean, that means this list successors is empty. But also, the, the old uh, version of new nodes has already been empty. So there is no, no, no more work to do. Huh? So this happens, for example, uh, sorry. Suppose all these nodes are leaf nodes, and these are leaf nodes too. Then, I mean, this list is empty, so, uh, uh, no, so, uh, sorry. Suppose they are all leaf nodes, yes. Uh, I mean, we first, and these are leaf nodes too, yes. So then we would expand uh, this guy and this guy, they wouldn't have any successors, then we would start with this one. And we would go through the whole list until here. And then, uh, I mean, these would all vanish from new nodes. Huh? And then at this point, the list new nodes would be empty. And we're finished. Um, yes. So that's when we are here. If new nodes uh, is not empty, then um, we would do a recursive call of our function breadth first search on the list new nodes. And now you see that this parameter is a list. It's not just one node, because the recursive call would get the full list of all open nodes. Yes, and of course, it needs to know the goal. What is the goal in order to check whether a current node is a goal node or not? Huh? Um, okay, this is the recursive call, and um, we return as a return value the return value of breadth first search. Okay, so if new nodes is not empty, we do the recursive call. If it is empty, we return no solution. Okay. Yeah. Okay, L let me note that this algorithm is generic. What means 
you can apply it to any search problem. But of course, in order to uh, really solve the a particular search problem, uh, you have to adapt it onto this problem and there are only the two functions goal reached and successors which have to be modified. Um, yeah. In order to check whether the current node is a goal node, we need some semantics. We have to compare the, cur the current node with the goal node. That means we need some kind of equality function uh, that of course is uh, application specific. Yeah? For example, if we do the eight puzzle, we have to check whether the structure, my current structure, is identical to the goal state of the eight puzzle. Yeah? Um, and of course, the successors function, which we apply here, that produces the successors of a node. Uh, this one uh, is the most important because it really tells, for example, for the eight parcel, if, you, if we have uh, uh, the, the empty tile in a corner, uh, then, of course, only two actions are possible. If it's a center position, then four actions are possible. So here we have to implement the semantics of the particular search problem. Okay, analysis. So now we talk about these properties like completeness, optimality. Okay, this algorithm is complete. Whenever there is a solution, it will find the solution. Why? I mean, because it sweeps through the whole search tree level by level. So it will complete the second level before it starts with the, with the uh, third level and so on. So that means if there is a solution on level two, this will be found before we start expanding level three. If there is a solution on level n, this solution will be found before we start with level n plus one. Um, yes. It is optimal under one condition. It is optimal if, all, if the cost of all actions are the same. Why do we need this uh, condition? Let's go back to the picture. Um, yes. So maybe, oh, let me look. Suppose we take this path here to node number 24. And suppose the costs that we, that we need, um, the costs on all the paths are um, one, huh? except on these uh, three edges, we have different costs. Huh? Um, and suppose the cost here for each of these um, edges is only half of the cost. It's 0.5. And suppose this is a solution node. Yeah? And suppose this is a solution node too. Okay, then the cost to find this solution node is 2. The cost to find this solution node is 
So this is actually the optimal solution. But this one would be found first and the algorithm would terminate here and it would not uh, expand this guy. Because, I mean, of course this node number 11 uh, is being produced before we have these guys. So then the algorithm would find a solution with cost 2, but it would not find the better solution with cost 1.5. Is this clear? But if we assume that the cost for all expansions is the same, so we can assume it is 1, then the cost here is 2 and the cost for this guy is 3. The cost for all of these is 3. So that means when we have expanded depth 2 and we found a solution, then we can stop and it's guaranteed that this solution is optimal. But if the costs are not uniform, not constant, uh, this is uh, no longer true. Okay, so that's why we have this condition here. Now let's talk about the computation time. The computation time um, um, grows linearly with the number of nodes we have expanded. Okay, so the only thing we have to do after expanding the whole tree to a certain depth, we have to sum over the number of nodes on all depths. That's what we have to do and you see it here. So it's a constant time, that's the time it takes to expand one node. And this has to be multiplied by the sum over the number of nodes in all levels from i equals zero to depth d. And this again is the well-known uh, geometric series. Here we have the formula. And as you can see, um, so if, uh, if we have a, a, a bigger uh, depth or a higher branching factor, then you can neglect, uh, neglect uh, these minus ones here and then the b here cancels out and we have b to the power of d. That's what remains here. Huh? Um, yeah, so the, the complexity is b to the power d um, and that's not so good because it grows exponentially with the depth. Huh? And I mean, what is the the semantics of the depth in terms of our search problem. Think of chess or the eight puzzle or a theorem proofing problem. What is the semantics of the depth of the search tree? What does depth mean in terms of our search problem? Yes, but my question is, what does it mean, the depth in the tree? It's, yes, it's a, a more complicated problem. It's a harder problem. Huh? Um, let's talk about chess. What is the depth of the search tree in terms of a chess game? not finding all the possibilities. Finding all possibilities, all moves, all possible moves is actually expanding the whole tree. Yeah? So the, the depth of the tree, uh, look at, at such a tree. I mean, if we take one chess game 
This will actually be one path down in the search tree. And the length of such a path is exactly the depth of the tree. So the depth of the tree is the length of our chess game or in, in the eight puzzle example the depth of the tree is the number of moves of tiles we do uh, or in theorem proving the depth of the tree is the length of the proof we find finally. Huh? Um, okay and of course the longer the proof is the harder it is to find. I mean, if it's a proof with one step only, everybody would see the solution immediately. But if it's a very long proof, then that means you have to try a lot and search long and so on. And the same thing with a, with a chess game. Huh? Um, okay, so um, let's for the moment take the depth of the tree as a measure for the hardness of the problem. Uh -huh. And if you increase the hardness of your problem linearly, then the search effort even grows exponentially. And that's really bad. Uh -huh. That is really bad. Uh, for example, um, suppose we have our search tree um, at a depth d equal 27. Huh? So we have done 27 steps down here. In, so this, the solution up to now has a length of 27. And now suppose the problem will be a little bit harder. Just a little bit. That means the solution node is on depth equal 28. So we increase the problem uh, just a very little bit. And now suppose we have a branching factor like it is in chess of 35. So how much will your search effort increase? 35 times. Yeah. So you, we, we, um, we increase the difficulty a very little bit, but our ser search effort um, is multiplied by a factor of 35. Huh? And that's pretty bad. Now suppose the solution is on d equal 29. So this is what we get here. Um, then the effort is multiplied by 35 squared, which is more than 1,000. Uh, so the problem gets a thousand times harder if you take two extra depths. Uh, and that shows you that it's actually really critical whether the solution is here or there or there. That's critical. I mean, suppose the search effort takes you um, two hours up to here. Then one more depth means 70 hours, which is more than three days. Huh? And two more depth means 1,000 hours. So exponential growth of the search space is really bad. Okay. You might say, okay, I am patient, I'm willing to wait three days, I'm even willing to, to wait 100 days, which, we, which you would have to do here. 100 days, what's that? It's only uh, three and a half months, so that's not too much. Maybe you're really patient, I am not. Yeah? But the real problem you get is in terms of memory space. Because the memory you need in your computer increases exponentially with the depth too. Huh? So, um, the, yeah, I mean, look at this. D equal 28. So we have uh, the number of nodes is uh, 
number of nodes is about b to the power d, which is here 35 to the power 28. Huh? And that's pretty bad. That's really bad. There is no memory on this globe where you could store this search tree. No chance to ever store this search tree. Really no chance. And that's why you can forget this algorithm. You can really forget breadth first search. I mean for little very tiny problems. Even for the eight puzzle you get problems. And that's a really tiny problem. Huh? Uh, the, the, what, what do we see? The average branching factor is 1.8. Huh? It is not 35, it's 1.8. But uh, even for this little problem, you get problems. Okay, um, yeah. Now, for uniform cost search, um, so this is. I don't understand what's written here, so I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, so, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, I see, I mean, yeah, this is just the definition of uniform cost search. Sorry, I didn't introduce what's uniform cost search. Yeah. Um, I already said, we, we have seen, um, where was it? No. Yeah, here, here. Uh, breadth first search is optimal only if all costs are the same. If the costs are not uniform, then we use a variant of breadth first search in order to, uh, to get optimality. Huh? Um, because breadth first search is only optimal under this condition. Now, what, what can we do if the costs of the individual expansions are not constant? Now, what, what does breadth first search do now? It sorts the open nodes in our list new nodes. These nodes are sorted. And how are they sorted now? How are they sorted? They are sorted by the time they were produced. Huh? Look here. This guy has number 11, number 12, and then comes number 13, and so on. Huh? So they are sorted by the time they were produced. And what we now do in uniform cost search, we use a different sorting key. We do not use this time level when they were produced. We use um, the, the cost that we had up to this point. So suppose we had here a cost of 2 and here a cost of 1.5. And that means the, the sorting key here is smaller than the sorting key here. Uh, and this implies that this node will be expanded before that node. Huh? So if we use the, the cost that we had up to that point uh, and sort the nodes in this order, then... Um, this new search algorithm, which we call uniform cost search, is optimal. So that's a variant of breadth first search, which is optimal. But it is still useless. Huh? Why? Because it still expands our nodes breadth first. And it still consumes uh, too much memory. Okay, so now let's look at depth first which is a variant of breadth-first search. And uh, so on this uh, slide, we see many snapshots of what depth-first search does. I mean, depth-first means we go first into the depth and not into the breadth of the tree. So we start here, expand these three nodes, 
and then we expand the leftmost node, this, this guy, and that's the, the snapshot we have here. And then again, we take the leftmost uh, node on the deepest level we have, uh, which is this guy, and then we get what we have here. And then we expand, uh, so, oh yeah, yeah. Um, so now suppose um, these are leaf nodes and they are no solution nodes. Huh? So that means the search terminates and is not successful. Uh, as a consequence, uh, so these are uh, no successful nodes, the search terminates here, so that means we have to expand all these guys here. So and then we will continue in a depth first manner. So first, I mean, our search terminates here. And that means, I mean, these are uh, not successful nodes, so they will be cancelled. This will be removed immediately, then this guy will be removed, and then this will, re will be removed. So, and then we go back to this node number five, and then we see, okay, there are no, no more successors. This will be removed too. We go back to two, and then we have these remaining nodes here, and then we will continue expanding number six. What happens here? Okay. And I mean, this process of going back here is called backtracking. Huh? We do the backtracking, expand number six. Now, suppose these are non successful nodes either. Then we do backtracking again, get back to two, expand number seven. Then if these are not successful, again backtracking, go to eight, expand eight. Um, and now, um, if these are failure nodes, then we do backtracking again to eight, to two. And then here, now it's different. Um, yeah. Uh, now it is different because two has no, no more uh, successors, so we have to go back to one and expand number three, what happens here, and so on, until finally it looks like that, and if these are failure nodes, then uh, there is no solution. Okay, so this is depth first search, and what we see immediately, hopefully, is that it consumes much less memory. Huh? Because we do not fill up one depth uh, with all uh, nodes that are produced. Actually, at the end, when we finish here, you see all 32 nodes are produced. But they are not being stored in memory. So, um, yeah, at what point do we have the most memory consumption? I guess it is here. Yeah. How much memory do we need at that point? So before, in breadth-first search, the memory consumption was b to the power d. It uh, grows exponentially. How is it here? b times d. b times d? Why? Uh, we have on every level of the tree the branching factor. Yes, that's true. So. Of course, we assume a constant branching factor. Huh? Or we could say the number of nodes on each level is at most the maximum branching factor, which is 4 here. Huh? So here it's less than 4, here it's 4, and here it's less than 4. Okay? Yeah, so on each level, at most, we have B nodes, and we have D levels, so B times D. And that's a really success because now the memory consumption 
grows only linearly with the depth and that's you can neglect it. You really can neglect it um, so that means suppose the branching factor is 35 and you have one gigabyte of memory okay you can compute uh, how deep you can search yeah? that's, that would be extremely deep and you will never ever fill up your memory. Why? I mean you, you could even live with a computer that has um, 500 kilobytes of memory, no problem. Why will we never fill up the memory? Because the old switch could be deleted. I mean, that's not successful. Not yes, but anyway, I mean, if you go down very deep in the search tree, finally you would fill up every memory. But you will never go down so deep. The computation time still grows exponentially. So yeah. It so much time. So in, yeah. Let's say in order to search the whole tree, it takes exponential time. It takes exponential time. Yeah? Um, so, and uh, that means you will, you will never fill up uh, a, a large memory. I mean, actually, yeah, it's, it's not really, um, yeah, let's say, hmm. You may fill up the memory, but then you have searched only a tiny part of the tree. I mean, you may run down very deep, huh? but even though you are down very deep, you searched only an extremely tiny part of the tree. What did you do? Suppose this is the tree and it uh, your algorithm may really run down but what you have searched then is this. That's what you have done but you didn't look at all the rest. So either way you do it. So if you go r really run down the, the whole way you wouldn't search the rest of the tree and you would miss with very high probability all solutions. So this doesn't look too good either. So we have solved the memory problem, but we have lost completeness. This algorithm is no longer complete. Why? It runs down all the way here. Suppose the tree is infinitely deep. If it's, only, if it's only a finite depth, then everything is fine. So if there is a depth bound at a certain depth, everything is fine. Then the algorithm is complete. It will really hit the depth bound. That's what we had here. Here we hit our depth bound. That means the, the end of the tree. And then we will search everything. But suppose the depth of the tree is infinite, then we really have a problem. And many, many search problems do have an infinitely deep tree. Look at this um, simple eight puzzle. In the eight puzzle, you can infinitely long um, uh, uh, shift your tiles around. There is no, no limit. So the search tree in the 8 parcel has infinite depth. And now if you naively apply this depth first search, it would just run down here and with high probability never find a solution. Okay, so the memory problem is solved but it's incomplete. That's really unfortunate but that's how it is. Uh, 
So if we talk about a finite tree with finite depth, what about the time then? How is the time if the depth of the tree is finite? So I think here is longer. Is longer? No, it's the same. It's the same. I mean, what, what do we have to do? We have to expand all nodes. Okay, ah, and, and you, um, yeah, because we have to do backtracking, um, yeah, but I mean, I don't worry about this because this is just a constant factor. So in the worst case, you have to expand all the edges twice. But this is just a factor of two, and we computer scientists don't worry about such a constant factor. And also, I mean, we really would have to look deeper into the algorithms. Um, for example, in, uh, if you do breadth-first search, then you have to store very many nodes on, on, on each level. And then you get, a, you get an extra problem, because you have to sort the list of open nodes. And this list may be really long. So if you do this naively, you get actually um, a square into your result. Then you have the square of b to the power d, and then it's really bad. Huh? So don't forget the sorting of this list of open nodes. And here, the list of open nodes is really tiny. Don't, uh, I mean, this doesn't cost you anything to sort, uh, let's say, 30 nodes. But in breadth-first search, the list of open nodes may be um, extremely big. Huh? So actually, breadth-first search is if you do a real implementation um, and you do the sorting of the list of open nodes, and, I mean, we, you could do it efficiently, that's very important. How would you do this? How would you sort the list of open nodes? I mean, this is the question to the computer scientists. You should know it. Huh? We have, uh, so in, in breadth first search, we have this list of open nodes here. And now, um, when we expand one node, this node, then we get a couple of new nodes which we have to uh, sort into our list. I mean, with the normal breadth first search, we just put them at the beginning. That's not really a problem. Uh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, no, we put them actually at the end. We put them at the end. Why do we put them at the end? Yeah, that's true. I mean, if we put these new nodes at the beginning, then this one would have number one, two, three, four, and this one would be 515, 516, and so on. And that would mean these guys would be expanded first. So we, we cannot put them at the beginning of the list. We have to put them at the end. So let's say this is 4,729. Uh, uh, so this will then, then be really at the end. So you see, we, we have to sort these guys in at the end. Okay, and putting, but putting them at the end uh, isn't a problem either. The problem would be to put them at some point in the list. We don't have this problem with bread first search. With bread first search, we put them always at the end of the list. But now think of uniform cost search. If our costs of the individual um, edges are not constant, then we sort this list by the cost we had already, and then these nodes may have any cost and then we really have to sort them into the list at the, the appropriate point. And now the question to the computer scientists is, how can we do this efficiently? No, 
first question, if we do it naively, produce a new node with a certain search, um, um, sorting key. Now we have to find the place where it fits into my list. What is the complexity of this if you do it naively? I mean, this is what, what you do all the time. You have a queue of, of some jobs waiting for something and then there is a new job coming and you have to uh, put it at the appropriate point in the list. I mean, the, t the time grows linearly with the length of the list. In the worst case, you have to traverse the whole list up to the end. Huh? So the time just for putting the new node at the right point grows linearly with the length of the list. But the length of our list in breadth first search is exponential in the depth. So it takes you, it would take you exponential time to put your new node at the right point. And that's pretty bad. That's really bad. Huh? But we can do it better. How would you do that? Think of Grundlagen der Informatik. With binary search? Um, with binary search? Yes, you could do. You could do that. Yes, that's right. You could do binary search and then the effort would be how much? It would be the logarithm. It would be the binary logarithm of the length of the list. So then the effort would be log base 2 of b to the power d. Because this is the breadth, the length of the list. And then this is d times log uh, b. And you see this is no longer really a problem. So it's linearly in the depth and just the logarithm of the branching factor. So if you do binary search, then it's no problem. But the problem is not solved yet. Because, I mean, if we do this, we have to put the new nodes into the list. But then, when we expand, for every new expansion of a node, we, let me see, no, we have to find the first guy, yeah, and this goes in constant time. see something? Yes, okay. Here is the problem with binary search. Um, so you're completely right. Finding the position where this new node has to fit is easy and can be done very fast. But um, how about really putting the node at this point here? How would you put this node here? What's the problem we get when we really have to squeeze it in here? 
I mean, it's a matter of data structures. So now let's talk about data structures and, and about the problems. Yeah, using a link to this. This is not that. Um, using a linked list is not a problem. Because you would just have to modify two pointers by inserting this variable. Um, yes, yes, you're right. If you use a linked list, then you can just move the pointers. But if you use an array, then you would have to shift all the rest of the array. Um, and now the question is, can we use a linked list here? Sure, no, the, the binary oh yes, search that's yeah. yeah, that's not true. No, not possible with the binary search. Huh? So you can either do binary search or have a, a linked list. That's the problem. So uh, we cannot solve the problem with the binary search. But what can we do? So what? Uh, so you say we go up one level and to search here, or what? That wouldn't help. Actually, this is deleted already. If we do breadth first search, we only have the list of open nodes. No, this w this wouldn't help. But what we could do is heap sort. Huh? You could maintain a heap. So maintain the list of open nodes in a heap and in the heap we have a, a list data structure, actually a heap data structure and uh, in the heap data structure that's the big advantage. You can insert in logarithmic time and you can access all the nodes in logarithmic time. Uh, that's a big advantage. So I in implementing such a breadth first algorithm uh, with non-uniform cost, you would have to use heap sort. Otherwise, you uh, increase the computation time. You have an extra increase, dramatic increase of computation time. So it wouldn't work uh, at all. Okay. Um, yeah. But back to, back to uh, depth first search. We are actually here in depth first search. And this is a problem too, because I mean it is. It doesn't consume much uh, storage. It is pretty fast, but it is incomplete. It is incomplete if the uh, search tree has infinite depth. That's the problem. Okay, so let's first go to this slide to the analysis. Incomplete. It is not optimal. Oh, why is it not optimal? Yeah, just because of this reason. If my search runs down here, and maybe here is a solution at a depth of 500, and here is a solution at a depth of 15, it wouldn't find this, it, uh, so it would miss the optimal solution. Computation time is of course exponential in finite trees, but memory requirement is only linear. But still, I mean, this is a real problem. We want to have complete search algorithms. Um, yeah, I, I skipped this uh, source code. It's very similar to uh, what we had in breadth first search and you can look at it at home. Okay, the solution for this problem is called iterative deepening. We can make our depth first search complete by doing iterative deepening. So what we do is 
we impose an artificial depth limit on our tree. So we already said that if the tree is finite, there is no problem. Depth first search is complete, it is fast, it doesn't take much memory. Everything fine. Okay, so let's make the tree finite. Of course, if we make the tree finite, if we just cut the tree here, then um, our algorithm is no longer complete. Suppose the solution is down here, the first solution is down here, we wouldn't find it. Okay? So we cannot just make a fixed cut, but we can cut our search tree here, search the whole tree. If we find no solution, then we increase our depth limit by one and search again. And if there is no solution, we increase it again and again. That's what you see here. We put a depth limit at depth one. Search, if there is no solution, we put it at two, three, four, and so on. And that's the search algorithm to use. Isn't it nice? You don't look so happy. Why? Why, on, why are you not happy now? This is the perfect search algorithm. Tell me, why do you look so unhappy? Be honest. Maybe because this algorithm is really stupid. Look here. We search the whole tree up to depth 6. And then we find now no solution. So, and what is our conclusion? Let's start the whole thing from scratch and do all the work again and on level 7 too. So extremely much redundant work. That's the disadvantage of this algorithm. But this extremely much is not true. Extremely little redundant work. That's actually the conclusion, and I will prove this for you. Okay, so this is iterative deepening. We have to... Um, so this is actually the algorithm. And we use our depth first search with a little modification, with a slight modification. What is the modification? We have to... We have to impose a depth limit. So there is this additional parameter, which is the depth limit. So we call depth first search with a fixed depth limit. Um, and then we need a variable, an internal variable of this algorithm, which uh, tells me on which depth um, I have been at the moment. Because, I mean, you see, this is a, a recursive algorithm and it recursively calls itself and look, if, we, if this is being called with, depth, with this depth, then the recursive call is, of course, um, on depth uh, plus one. Huh? So we increase the depth by one on every uh, recursive call. That's why we need this uh, counting variable. But that's the only change um, to impose the depth limit. So now we can start depth first search with a given limit. And the iterative deepening, I mean, this is just a loop uh, which loops over uh, all the depths. So we start with a depth limit of uh, zero, um, and then we call depth first search uh, with uh, What's that? Depth first search. Oh, this is this is an error, of course. Uh, this has to be a depth limit. No? So, <coughs> yeah. So if you if you have printed the slides, this is depth limit. How is it in the book? Is it is this error in the uh, who has the English book? It's the same. Okay, we have to correct it. Huh? 
So this has to be depth limit. This is a translation error. This is not in the German book. Okay, so we call our depth first search, our bounded uh, depth first search with the depth limit, then we increase the depth limit by one and we just iterate over this. Until um, the return value of depth first search is solution found. Okay. But now we have, uh, yeah, the, the analysis is pretty simple. It is complete. It is optimal. If the costs are constant and the increment is uh, equal to one. The increment, the depth increment, that's important. We, we have to use a depth increment of one. I mean, we could actually say in order to reduce redundant work, we, we use a bigger depth increment like 2 or 10 or something like that, but then the algorithm wouldn't be optimal anymore. Why? For optimality, we need an increment of 1. It could miss some solutions. In the yeah. Brain. It could miss some solutions. Look. Suppose this is my depth limit, and now I use a big increment of the depth limit and suppose my solution is here, my optimal solution is here. Then of course, and there is uh, also a solution here or maybe there, then my algorithm would find this solution and it would not find the optimal solution in between. But of course, if I do a little small increment of one, then of course this solution would be found before that. Okay. Um, so it's optimal if we have constant costs and an increment of one. Computation time is of course still exponential, but yeah, maybe it would be even worse than exponential. We have to prove that it's not worse than exponential because we do this re redundant, repeated work all the time. No? That's what we will prove. And memory requirements are still only linear. I mean, this is, I guess this is obvious, isn't it? I mean, the memory requirements are just the memory requirements of depth first search. Okay, but now how about the redundant work? We have to do a little computation. Um, yeah. So what we have to do now is, yeah, draw a new picture. Suppose we are at depth D here. Huh? Then the number of nodes inside the tree up to depth D, that's what I call NB of D. So with a constant branching factor B and the depth of D, the number of nodes in this tree is NB of D. Okay, so now, and then we have the, the depth of the whole tree we search is d max. Now, if we would use, for example, breadth first search or depth first search, the time required would be nb of d max. Okay, which is B 
big O of B to the power D. That's what we know already. The number of nodes in a tree uh, with depth D max grows exponentially with the depth. That's what we have seen before. Uh, I mean, this is just the geometric series. Huh? So, um, this is the number of nodes on all levels, summed up. Okay? And this sum results in a big O of B to the power D. Now, what we have to do in iterative deepening, we have to compute an extra sum. This is already the result of the sum of the nodes on all levels. But now we do the redundant work. So what we have to do now is we have to uh, compute the sum over d equal 1 up to d max, actually to d max. That's what we have to compute, this sum. Huh? Um, that's the, the whole work. But I do compute it only up to d max minus 1. Why? Because um, if I um, would know the perfect depth d max, I would just put this depth bound and I would find the solution. So that's what we have to do anyway. But the, in some sense, Redundant, yeah, the redundant work is searching all the depths up to d max minus 1. That's redundant work. And now I compute the, the amount of redundant work. Uh, how much redundant work do we do? And that's the sum over all the trees up to d max minus 1 uh, over nb of d. Okay. Now what is nb of d? nb of d is, yeah, you see it here, and b of d max, uh, so for the whole tree, is the sum over b to the power i over all levels. And that's the geometric series, that's the formula for d max. For, for any d, we get b to the power d plus 1 minus 1 over b minus 1. Okay, so that's just the result of the geometric series, and we have to, of course, sum it over all levels up to d max minus 1. Okay, and now we have to do a little bit mathematics. We take this uh, b minus 1 because it's constant. It does not depend on the depth. We just uh, pull it out of the sum. That's what we get here. Um, yeah, and then we have in the sum b to the power d plus 1. And then this minus 1 this minus 1, that's the sum over minus 1 um, from d equal 1 to d max minus 1. So this just gives us a d max minus 1. So minus d max minus 1 gives minus d max plus 1. Okay. Um, so what's the difference between this? Ah, yeah, okay. And now here, in this sum, we shift the summation index. Here, the sum goes from 1 to d max minus 1. Now we let it go from 2 to d max. Uh, so we increase this index. If, if at the same time we decrease this exponent, that sum is the same as this. Okay, and now... Now we here look at this sum. This sum is actually the same as this guy, just that we do not start at 0 but at 2. That's the only difference. Okay? So we can use this. Now we can uh, replace this with this formula. That's what we did here. But of course we have to subtract two terms. So d equals 0, um, which is 1, and d equals 1, which is b. So we have to subtract 1 and b. 
that's what we do here. And I'm sorry, the rest, uh, which is this, is, is uh, we can't read it there. Okay, and now we do an approximation. Now, if for for big branching factor, we can just neglect all these terms behind here, because here we have an exponential growth with the depth, and uh, we can just neglect this. So what remains is this, and um, yeah. And what we get is 1 over b minus 1 times nb of d max. Look at this. This is exactly nb of d max. Now, what have we learned here? We have learned that this is the amount of redundant work. The amount of redundant work is the amount of work we have to do anyway, but divided by b minus 1. So if our branching factor is 35, then the amount of redundant work is 1 35th of the whole work. So you can neglect it. If the branching factor is 2, which is very small, then the amount of redundant work is half. So half of the whole work is redundant. But this is a constant factor either, so don't worry about that. But uh, we, we rather have to worry about large branching factors because for large branching factors, then the, the amount of redundant work or the portion of redundant work is getting smaller and smaller. Yeah? Okay, yeah, so we have to finish now.